Good evening. Hello. Hi, I'm Annette McMenon and Bakley, Senior Vice Dean in the College of Liberal Arts, and we're here to talk to you, our students and uh, staff and uh, parents, about what's going to happen this fall semester. Um, so I'm Annette. I'm Vice Dean. I'm an alum from Temple. I've worked for Temple for about 25 years, and this has been a crazy year. So um, we're trying new things to try and reach out to you uh, to make sure we all are kind of on the same page for the fall. I'd like to introduce our panelists this evening. I'm going to introduce them in alphabetical order. They will, of course, appear in a different way. Uh, Liz Anselmo, you want to wave, Liz? Uh, Liz is the Associate Director of Career Services, uh, the Joyce K. Salzburg Career Center in the College of Liberal Arts. Uh, Dr. Rachel Groner is the Director of First Year Writing. Uh, Dr. Keith Gumry is the Director of the College of Liberal Arts program uh, in the Bachelor of Liberal Studies online program and the coordinator of all of our online education efforts this year. <clears throat> um, Dr. Robin Kolodny is the Chair of Political Science and Professor of Political Science. Dr. Gabe Wedick is professor of the English in the English department, and he's the faculty advisor for English majors. Chris Wolfgang is the assistant dean for student services and uh, oversees all of our uh, advising and career services in the college. Uh, Dr. Sandra Suarez is here as well, and I'm going to ask Sandra, uh, who is the associate dean for faculty affairs and uh, research, to give us a, a welcome from the dean's office. There we go. Thank you, Anand. Uh, hello, everyone. On behalf of the College of Liberal Arts, I want to welcome you to this information session. Uh, I want to thank the students and the parents uh, for being here. Um, as Annette said, I'm a senior associate dean in the College of Liberal Arts, but I'm also a professor of political science. I am Puerto Rican, born and raised. I'm also the parent of two college age kids, so I know what some of you are feeling right now. Uh, I have been at Temple for 25 years. We tell the students that Temple is going to get into your soul, but the truth of the matter is that Temple gets into the soul of the faculty and the staff uh, who work here. Uh, we kind of come and we never want to leave. Um, as you will learn from our wonderful panel of professors, academic advisors, chairs, and program directors today, many things have changed at Temple since the outbreak of the pandemic. But the fact of the matter is that many things remain the same. And some of those things that remain the same are, are, the, uh, are, are, are the ones that attracted you to Temple University. So for example, we're still a Research One university that hasn't changed. That means that we're, we're one of the top research universities in the United States. And if you are one of the top research universities in the United States, you are one of the top research universities in the world. We still have wonderful professors who are experts in their field, uh, in their fields, and who write books and articles that you're going to read in your classes or conduct experiments that you're also going to do um, in your classes. Uh, we are all, we still, I always like to say, a microcosm of the university because we offer everything. We offer STEM courses, uh, humanities, social sciences, fine arts. So on a typical day, you could start your day uh, either virtually or in person reading the Federalist Papers or having a discussion about one of the books written by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. You may, in, you know, during your lunchtime, uh, be asked to participate in a career advising event. And in the afternoon, you might be taking a course in cybersecurity or brain science. Uh, so those are some of the examples of the many things that remain the same and that we hope that you can take advantage of uh, during fall 2020. Uh, now I'm going to give it back to Annette, who's our moderator. 
So thanks so much, Sandra. Um, I'd like to kick off our poll, if you don't mind. So now that you know a little bit about us, we'll talk to you some more about our different areas. I'd like to uh, get a sense of who's in the audience today. We had uh, quite a large number of uh, folks RSVP for this event. So uh, identify whether you are a continuing student, a new student, whether you're a freshman or transfer, if you're a parent, if you're a few of you are sitting around uh, one device, go ahead and click the other button. And then we'll have a sense of if you're sitting together as a family. So we can all see, I think the poll results uh, are coming in. It's uh, divided up kind of the way I expected, right? Where we have a lot of uh, continuing students, a good number of new students to Temple this fall, and uh, you know, a fair number of parents, and then a few uh, folks who are faculty or staff. So great, um, I'm gonna end the poll now just so that we have a feel as a group for how to respond to some of the questions that you've asked. Um, I will share the results with you right now. And then I'm gonna stop it. And I'm going to close this out. Sorry, this is the first time we did the poll. This is a brand new thing for us. So you're you are all here as witnesses to our first webinar. So it's kind of exciting um, or scary, whichever. Uh, so here we go. It is very weird. Like we do a lot of public speaking. It's very weird to talk into a void. I just want you all to know that we're doing the best we can today. All right. So. I want to tell you a little bit, I want to go back in time to those simpler days of February when coronavirus was on the other side of the world and we weren't thinking about uh, too much. But of course, Temple is a multinational university. So we were, in fact, already preparing for um, coronavirus and how, to, how it might impact the different educational opportunities that Temple students are participating in. So because we have a campus in Japan, and Japan is, as you know, very close to China, um, our students in Japan were uh, sent uh, home in the end of February. And all courses at the Temple Japan campus moved to online course delivery immediately at the very end of February. Um, the first week of March, while you all were on happy spring breaks, um, I was consulting with Keith Gummery, who is on our call with us today, and who, you know, Keith handles all of our online training. And I said, you know, there might be a chance that there would be a few courses where, you know, if, it, if someone got sick or something that we would want to do some online education in the spring. That was the first week of March. And of course, as we all know, spring break ended, we all came back. And by the end of that first week back, um, the whole university had pivoted to online education. So, um, you know, we, we were prepared as well as we could be, I think, at that moment. And, uh, but we really were at very much in triage mode. And so things happened in the spring that, you know, it was our first pandemic. We were figuring it out, right? So we're still working through um, some of those issues. And we'll respond to some of your questions about that uh, in a few minutes. So um, then when, uh, you know, all summer long, we have spent quite a lot of time uh, preparing new courses, training our faculty for online and blended course deliveries. I have, in fact, the meeting I was in right before this was what we call the return team at Temple, which is a meeting of faculty and staff from all around the different schools and colleges and central administration to try and smooth this transition back uh, to campus for the fall semester. So um, there's a lot that changes on a regular basis. So always keep up to date with Temple's coronavirus uh, website that has, uh, you have your return tab on your TU portal or temple.edu slash coronavirus is always going to provide the most up to the up to date kind of policy changes and things like that. But we can talk about where we are today. And maybe it'll still be where we are in a month. And you know, if not, then we'll be making announcements and things like that. So I think I want to ask Keith to kind of kick off uh, some uh, we have a few questions kind of about how students can learn better online and I was thinking maybe it would be helpful for um, parents and students to hear about the training that our faculty have been going through this semester. Can you give us a few uh, pointers there? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Annette. Um, I'm Keith Gummery. I also have quite a long history with Temple. 
Um, I did my master's degree and PhD at Temple and then transitioned into working for Temple. And then I left. But um, as Sandra said, you know, you can try and leave, but it's like the Hotel California, right? Um, you get dragged back. So uh, for the last uh, three years, I've been working for Temple again. And actually, I do all of my work remotely. I'm actually in Copenhagen in Denmark. And I've been teaching online for Temple from here and then working with the faculty as far as, uh, you know, online teaching and what's involved in online teaching. So as Annette said, in March, we had to do a very quick pivot uh, to online teaching and course delivery. But we've had time to get really fully prepared for the fall. And instead of it being like an emergency move, we've had time to plan. So all of our fall instructors have been certified and will be certified for online teaching by the College of Liberal Arts by the start of the semester. They've all taken a training course that covers the best practices of online teaching, and they'll be using the technology and communication tools that now make online teaching an active and interactive experience. It's not like the kinds of online correspondence courses that people used to run in the past. It's a very, very different experience. So this semester, the university is gonna run courses in a variety of modes. There's gonna be synchronous courses, that is courses in real time online with everyone present at the same time in the same online classroom. There's gonna be asynchronous classes where the instruction will be posted online for each week. And the work can be done when a student has their own time during the course of the week to get the, the work for that week completed. And there'll be hybrid courses, which are a mixture of online classes and in-person interaction and instruction. So the development of technology means that communication and interaction online is of a much better quality than it's ever been before. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it continues to develop. I mean, think back how many of us heard of Zoom maybe six months ago, and now it's in use all the time, and developers are improving it almost weekly. So Temple uses also the Canvas Learning Management System, which I believe, having looked at the various systems that are on the market, I believe that it's the best system available today. And integrated into Canvas, we have systems like VoiceThread, which, fac which facilitates online video and audio discussion and ongoing discussion in the classroom and outside of class time. And we also use tools like Loom, Screencast-O-Matic, so that our instructors and students have interactive communication through a variety of different methods. We want our instructors to activate the learning in their classes. We don't want students sitting passively watching a screen. We will get students and instructors active and engaged in what they are learning, applying new knowledge to real situations and creating new knowledge out of what they're doing. We'll be supporting all of our teachers and students in their online learning through the next academic year. We have systems of coordinators set up to assist, assist instructors, to support the best practices of online teaching, and to maintain the high standards of our classes in all of our venues for teaching, both in-person and virtual online. The college and the university will guide students by keeping open forums for questions and feedback and providing resources to explain how to be successful in online courses. Our colleagues with us today are from different CLA programs, and they'll be able to explain to you how they're going to deliver a strong college experience that might look a little different from a traditional semester or semesters that we've run in the past, but it'll definitely be able to create the same value for you. So with that, uh, Annette, I hope that answers that, and I'll pass it back to you. Thanks so much. So one thing I didn't mention is that, of course, our classrooms are going to be fitted a little bit differently. So um, we're following the CDC guidelines and as well as the health and safety guidelines coming from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and the city of Philadelphia. So, you know, we're expecting that there will be six feet distance between students who are sitting in a room. So um, this is one of the reasons why a lot of our classes did have to shift online, right? That uh, a large lecture class, there weren't, there just aren't spaces on campus that are indoors and large enough to accommodate uh, some of our classes. So one of the models that we're using are hybrid courses. And um, actually the first year writing program, I think is doing a great job with this. Um, they're redesigning their course somewhat so that they have 
some in-person activities and some online activities for many of the sections. And since we have so many first year students, Rachel, I was wondering if you could kind of uh, set the stage there a little bit. Sure, I'd be happy to. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Annette. Um, it's nice to, to get a chance to tell you about first year writing. Um, first year writing classes in English are required of all students at the university, and they're usually really small. So they're around 20. Sometimes you get 22, 23, sometimes 19. It depends. Um, but they're nice and small. And we have them that small because we really believe that students improve their writing skills best when they're working in an, a, a kind of a small, close knit writing community. Um, and so our classes allow students to get to know each other and to develop some trust on a personal level. We talk about things like racism, social media, um, the uh, art and music, other topics that we might not all agree on. And that's good. We want some disagreement. We want debate and discussion. And you can only have that if you feel really comfortable with the people who are in the room. Um, in a regular semester, what we do to create that sort of community is that we do a lot of class discussions, small group work, we get out, out of the classroom and we go wander around campus and, and do fun activities. Um, we spend time in our classes talking about what it's like to be in college. So most of our students are in their first year. So we talk about what this transition is. You're, you're suddenly in college, you're, you're living on your own potentially for the first time. What is it like? How, how's everybody adjusting? We do a lot of that sort of discussion as well. Um, I've had students tell me many times that the, the classmates they meet in my first year writing classes end up being friends that they keep for the following years. Uh, partly because they've had this experience, this pretty intense experience together in this nice small class in their first year, that they get to they get to know someone well enough, and they actually have memorable experiences from that class. Um, you know, even if they're memorable experiences of a debate they had, but that's a really interesting formative moment. This fall will be different, obviously. <laughs> um, so when we all thought about moving online, we definitely, as Annette said, decided we wanted to do a hybrid course where we, every one of our classes will meet at least once. Some of them will meet in person on campus. Some of them will meet virtually on Zoom once a week. And then all the other work of the course will happen kind of as Keith described, that uh, there will be lots of things that will happen on Canvas or um, elsewhere, like we'll use Twitter, we'll use other online platforms to keep people engaged. Uh, but we decided as a faculty that it was really important to us that one way or another, we are going to build that same community. That is the core of our course. You have to have that comfortable community to talk about things. Um, otherwise, writing skills might get marginally better, but they're not going to get a lot better. And we actually want a lot better. We want, we want an increase, a dramatic increase in your writing abilities. Um, so we are gonna, we're going to prioritize making that community happen, even if we're online or even if we're in person six feet apart. Um, it's challenging to get a vibrant discussion to go when people are sitting so far apart, but we will do it. So come tell me if that's not true, but I, I guarantee that's going to happen. Um, and we've actually talked a lot as a faculty about how to make that happen, how we can create that sort of vibrant connection between each other, even if we're far apart or even if we're in front of our computers. Um, we really, as Keith said, we don't want first year writing students sitting in front of a, a computer. We don't do a lot of lecture. We want you to be engaged. Um, we want you to be connected. We know that not all students are excited about being online in any capacity again. Um, we all went through that flip online in March and not all of us liked it either. We all, we all were so shocked. Um, I actually have elementary school age children and watching them do it, I got to really take notes on what does not work well at all because they struggled a great deal. And so I, I know what I think doesn't work. And I think all of us have been watching and figuring that out. Um, we don't want to make any of those same mistakes. We want this to be better, um, better for us, better for students. Our faculty plan to check in with students a lot. We always do anyway, but we're going to check in even more often. What's working for you? What's not working for you? What can we do to adjust this experience so that it actually does work, that you are getting something out of this class that you need and want? Um, and again, we want, we want that too. We don't want to be bored for 16 weeks, believe me. <laughs> None of us do, do. We want this to be you know, as fun for us as it is for you. That's why we love to be teachers. I've been at Temples for 17 years um, and I do it because I absolutely love being in the classroom. So I have to make this work in order for me to, to keep going. This is really important to me um, and it will be important to you. Um, if your professor asks you for feedback, no matter what department's in, give it. Give feedback honestly and directly so that they can adjust um, their courses. I really hope that in a year or two, when my own first year writing students come back and tell me about where they are and what their majors are like and 
what they're doing. I really hope that they tell me that they still know at least one or two other people from our first year writing class. I hope that I still am able to create enough of a community for them that they have that same experience of making friends, getting to know people well, having experiences that they will remember for those four years um, and be able to laugh about and talk about later. Um, you know, Temple students and Temple faculty are really scrappy, fascinating people. That's why we're at Temple. We are interesting people. And I think if any faculty can do it, if any group of students can do this, I think we can. We're really, we are, we're made to do this and I, I'm confident it'll work out. I really look forward to meeting you. If you have any trouble, if anybody, anybody's in a first year writing class, come see me um, either virtually, I'll make an appointment with you or send me an email. We'll set up something to talk about. I wanna make sure you're having a good experience. So feel free to check in with me. Um, and now I'll turn it back to Annette. Thanks so much, Rachel. You know, I just want to echo, we really miss being at Temple. Um, you can see by most of us, we have our virtual backgrounds, our Temple places, like right here, right under the T would be my personal office. And I miss being there so very much, I can't even tell you. Um, I also wanted to underscore that several of us are parents of, you know, grade school, high school, college age students. So we saw, how that transition worked for our own children. And we heard very directly from our faculty um, how things worked with them. So we are really working very hard this year to make the fall as good an experience as possible. And I just wanna echo um, something else Rachel said about kind of how our students look back on this time, right? That this is a challenging time for all of us, right? And at, at, all, at all of our different levels and personally and professionally. And I think going through an experience like this is something that really kind of solidifies a community in a way that um, you don't really think about it. So, uh, you know, I, I can really see that the classes that are um, going through this right now at Temple are gonna have a, a really deep connection moving forward. So I just wanna put that out there that that is, you know, Temple is big in lots of ways, but I think we're all kind of looking for ways to increase our contact with each other and improve that community experience. And this is the first of one of those ways we're gonna do that this year. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Robin Kaladi to talk a little bit about uh, hybrid courses in the major, because I know you're planning, Robin, to uh, teach a course in your major that's gonna be a bit of a discussion section and a, an asynchronous lecture component. And I wonder if you could just kind of explain that to folks so that they have a better sense of what's happening there. You're still muted, Robin. Sorry, thank you, Annette. Um, Yes, we, we have a whole variety of different ways to deliver courses. Some, as you've heard, will be completely in person. Some will be completely online. And then I'm teaching Intro to American Politics where I'll have an asynchronous lecture. That means I will record it and people can watch it when they like, but they will also have one hour a week where they will meet in person with a graduate student section leader who has also met with me and we, we will be having um, a coordinated agenda about which kinds of things we would like to make sure students are understanding or they're asking questions about because there's a lot going on in the US and so American politics is going to be really um, involved. But I'd like to say a couple of other quick things that um, just happened. Um, first of all, I was just uh, Zooming, this is what's so cool about Zoom with a colleague who is still on a research leave in Germany. He'll be back in two weeks. And he's teaching a research methods class that usually involves a small survey project. So we were talking about the problem that when you have an asynchronous lecture, you don't have a lecture time. So it's hard to figure out where you fit on the final exam grid. And he said, I think it's time we get away from the final exam. And we're going to build a portfolio about uh, polling and do a real project on that during the semester. Now, let me tell you that this particular professor has done high level polling analysis for two presidential campaigns and the opportunity that our students will have to do something like that, a project where that he didn't think he could do within the, um, the confines of the classroom, strangely enough, he thinks is actually more doable online. Um, the other thing I did notice, I've been following along in the Q&A, and as a department chair, um, I've been working with our faculty about the different ways that we're going, that we're going to be delivering the classes. And someone 
was asking, well, why, if I have a small class, might it be online? And I just want to point out that there may be many reasons um, that, inc including um, health of a faculty member or um, their our ability to find the right room at the right time. So if you're looking, there's a general pattern, but just trust us that we're, we're doing everything that's going to work as best as we can um, for everyone. I've also would encourage you if you aren't sure, obviously, you know, just contact academic advising, but if there's a particular class that you might want to look at a different format for taking, just email the department chair. We've encouraged people to email um, us and we have uh, worked just in the past three weeks with 75 students to uh, give them in person if they wanted that or put them online if they wanted that. You know, there are some, um, some you know, ways that we can do that. And echoing what everybody else said here, it's my um, love what we do. We love the kinds of students that Temple attracts. And uh, we like to talk about the grit of Temple students. And yeah, this just is another um, iteration in what we know that um, you're made of. You're made of, of the ability to adapt to the real world. And so I'll throw it back to Annette. Thanks so much, Robin. Um, we were getting a few questions in the chat. So I, I just wanna encourage folks who are watching to continue to ask questions. We have some really high level people who are either directly responding to you if it's kind of a uh, more direct uh, you know, individual case, but we will uh, pull all those questions together at the end and uh, have a, you know, we'll all jump in there. So I just wanted you to know that that's happening. Um, Gabe Wedick. Dr. Gabe Wedick from the English department, I'd like you to answer the question that we're getting about kind of what are faculty expectations for um, class participation? I know you're teaching two very different kinds of courses. One's a hybrid and one is a uh, fully synchronous online mm -hmm. class. And I wonder if you could kind of give a sense of how faculty are responding in these kinds of cases. Yeah, I'd love to, absolutely. I mean, and thank you everyone for, uh, you know, joining us with this. Um, you know, the connective tissue between what I'm going to say and what Robin just said is things that are doable. And in terms of participation, you know, I mean, when this happened in March, all I could think about is what am I going to do in terms of participation? For those, if there are people there who have had me for a class, you know, this is my, this is my thing. I run student center, uh, student centered classrooms, and it's all I know. It's the only thing I, I you know, that I, that I want to do in the classroom. And in terms of things that were doable, what happened is I never could have envisioned all the opportunities and ways that students who had, who had never participated before had access to the class in completely different ways because of different formats. Some of that had played out in the chat function. People who had never spoke felt comfortable doing that way. And then what you would see is they would gradually participate um, in a way that we are all now. Uh, by accident, I discovered an exercise where people used their virtual backgrounds and connected it to something that was going on in class. So, you know, I, I can, I, it, it's, it's, there are just so many new and interesting ways that, that I think create um, a dynamic classroom discussions. Um, I'm, you know, one of my classes is going to be a hybrid class, so we're going to meet in person on Tuesday. I actually selected that because it's, I, I wanted that in-person uh, contact and there was a room where it will be safe for all of us. And that's where I'm gonna set everything up for the Thursday class, with, which will be a synchronous class meeting. Uh, so it's gonna be an extension of our, Tuesday, of our Tuesday class. I chose synchronous and this is how other people are choosing and deciding what format they want for their classes. Uh, because it's really important to me that sense of community and people interacting with um, one, another, one another. Another class that I have is all synchronous. Um, and, you know, and again, I chose that because I wanted a, a class where we were meeting as a group. That is because some of that is, uh, it's about my style. It's about the topics that I teach. I do uh, film stuff um, and it just kind of works for me. So, you know, the, the thing, the thing that I'm hearing in bits and pieces with, with my uh, colleagues here is, um, yeah, I mean, it's going to look different, and but it's going to feel the same, and we're, we're really committed to that. So I'm actually kind of, I mean, don't take this in the wrong, I'm kind of excited about some of the new things that I'm going to be able to do um, with new technology. So 
I'm looking forward to the start of everything. That's great. Thank you so much, Gabe. Um, you know, I wanted to mention uh, there's a question that's coming in in the chat about kind of where to go between classes and things like that. So again, we are going to be socially distancing, but um, some students may find on their roster that they have you know, a class that has an in-person class meeting and their next class is a course that meets synchronously online. We're going to have lots of spaces that are set up all around the campus called Zoom zones. Um, you know, alliteration, we love it. Anyway, so we are going uh, to have these spaces available where students can still be socially distant and they can use their laptop or their phone and plug in and listen to online lectures, participate via chat, things of that sort. So the tech center is still going to have, um, you know, rooms available for students to work in, that kind of thing, the library. Um, there's also very likely going to be a tent somewhere on campus so that there are places for you to socialize and uh, have lunch and things like that while still maintaining social distances. So we're really cognizant that college life is both academic, straight up coursework, and um, all those kind of uh, corollary, corollary, uh, corollary activities, sorry, I'm losing my language here. Um, so activities like having lunch and talking to professors between classes and things like that, um, and whatever it is you do in your spare time. But um, there is also uh, a thing I wanted to mention about participation that um, has just come to mind, and that is that a lot of our faculty reported that students felt a lot more comfortable talking to their professors in the spring online, that they wouldn't have gone to office hours, but they would make online appointments with their faculty and have these face-to-face -face conversations. So I think that actually may end up being a real plus, right, that um, people make connections that way. And that's also one of the ways our advising folks are working. Uh, they're having their advising meetings on Zoom. So Chris, I was wondering if you could, um, you know, we're having a lot of questions about advising and other related student services. Why don't you walk us through kind of how the advising center has been working this summer and what your plans are for the fall? Absolutely, thank you, Annette. So, you know, when when we were ordered to go remote in, in mid-March, we, I think, probably had the same sense of panic and dread that everyone, that everyone else did at that time. Uh, but we, what we quickly learned um, is that going remote actually provided us with some incredible opportunities to do to accomplish some things that we had wanted to for quite some time and just never really had the the impetus to do so and so one of the things that you know we've been able to go paperless we've developed on our website a uh, a chat feature to replace our front desk we call it our virtual front desk so if if someone has uh trouble getting a hold of um, an advisor or if anyone is you know has a quick question they can engage with uh, one of our peer advisors they are staffing uh, that that chat feature on our website and they can get you connected with you know, with uh, the help that you are looking for so that's that's been a, a great feature um, and we have peer advisors, dedicated students who are working on some programming for the fall semester, uh, especially for uh, our, our new students to kind of help them get acclimated. Uh, just a teaser, the first Friday night of the, of the fall semester, they are, they are actively planning a game night. Um, and so, um, you know, we're hoping that you can join us for that. You know, we're finding, you know, I, I want to I want to echo what, you know, what, what Gabe said, and that is really um, this is and, and others said this is this is it's not better or worse, but it's different. And, and so I, I think that it's given us new opportunities to try things, to be creative. And and I feel like we've been able to um, have a great summer of orientation sessions it's been uh, much better than i than i ever would have imagined um, and so i think that this is going all of this experience will make us that much better when we finally do return to well actually we'll be moving into that beautiful space right behind me uh, that's a rendering of our new 
Academic Advising Center and Joyce K. Salzberg Center for Professional Development. So thanks. Thanks, Chris. Since you mentioned the uh, Joyce K. Salzberg Center, we should ask Liz to kind of talk about internships. We're getting a lot of questions from folks about what internship preparation looks like now and job searching in a pandemic and all those fun things that you know many of our students participated in prior to the pandemic and just how will that work moving forward? Thanks, Annette. A lot of really great questions that I can address. Um, but first off, as Annette mentioned, my name is Liz. I've been working at Temple University for about five and a half years and currently working in the Joyce K. Salzburg Center for Professional Development. If you're not familiar, the College of Liberal Arts has its own career center. So it's specialized specifically to meet the needs of our liberal arts majors, in addition to the University Career Center. The College of Liberal Arts has a very big focus on experiential learning. We understand that our students are gaining the most important skills in the classroom, such as critical thinking, communication, problem solving. But we also understand that's only half of the puzzle. They need to practice these skills in a professional environment through research, through internships, civic engagement. And so we strongly encourage our students to complete internships and really support them to do that. So this summer, something that I have been a part of is creating a large committee within the college to connect with employers in the Philadelphia area. We've surveyed hundreds of thousands of employers to find out what is their current recruitment status? Are they hiring interns? Has it switched to remote or online? And we found that a lot of employers absolutely want to still keep their internship programs, and they've typically converted them to online project-based experiences. People are always surprised when I share that we have many students this summer completing internships. Most of them are online because it is the safest way to work right now. As everyone here on the panel can attest, most of us are working online. So just like students, they also are oftentimes interning online. Um, I also want to mention that we have a lot of events, programming um, around supporting students as they prepare for graduate school or entering, entering right into a career. We have a career management system called Handshake. And I want to give a shout out to Mario, who is in the Q&A. Hi, Mario. Thank you for asking about Handshake. It's a great question. Mario wanted to know what is Handshake? And it's a career management system that is the best one you can possibly have. It is a system where 100% of the Fortune 500 companies are registered and posting jobs. It's a system that has thousands of internships and jobs posted. All of them are vetted and screened by our Career Center office and where so many of our students are able to find internships and our office supports them in applying. We make sure our students' application materials are polished. And we make sure also that anytime we know an employer, we try to connect our students directly to the employer. We try to make it as easy as possible for students to obtain both internships and jobs. We have students interning all over the place from the US Department of Commerce to Penn Environment to the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And we have a lot of partnerships with alum. As you can imagine, Temple has a huge network and we like to pull from that network. So we absolutely reach out and connect with our alum and sometimes they serve as mentors. We have a really great platform called Al Network and that is set up so our alum can directly connect with our students, mentor them, share advice, and sometimes connect them with internships and jobs. So to get back to Mario's question, Handshake, this platform that we have, all of our students have access to it and they can customize their profiles. It looks similar to a Facebook or some of our other social media platforms we're on regularly. And the reason is because we're all accustomed to it. It's easy to use and you can develop a profile and you can search for internships and jobs. It's a one-stop shop. You can see events that are coming up. I right now am in the planning mode for two really big virtual internship fairs happening the second week in October. I'm really excited. We have a lot of employers 
so happy to connect with our students virtually. And a lot of our employers are very quickly strategically thinking about how they can still maximize interns remotely um, and online. So I'm really excited to continue this fall. And uh, as Chris mentioned, I really think that although COVID has provided us with many challenges, it has also helped us become more resilient and recognize certain things that we can do that we would have never recognized before had we not experienced this. So I'm excited to really roll out a lot of our new events and experiences for students. I'm happy to connect to anyone. Um, my email address I'm happy to provide through the Q&A, um, but really excited to start the new semester and I wish you all well. Back to you, Annette. Thanks so much, Liz. So again, if you have questions, go ahead and throw them in the Q&A. Um, I would like uh, to ask Sandra to uh, talk about the Laura Scholars Program because I think there are some questions kind of about co-curricular activities and things like that. And I think that's a terrific program that's sponsored by the College of Liberal Arts. Yes, thank you, Annette. Um, uh, before I get into the Laura's, let me just, again, going with the theme of many things change, but many things stay the same. Uh, the college, I'm sorry, the university uh, continues uh, with all of its uh, paid research opportunities. So we will continue, for those of you who are familiar uh, with the Diamond Scholars, we will also continue with the Creative Arts and Research Scholarships, which we refer to as CARAS. All of the students get an email with information about the deadlines for those opportunities. Uh, as Annette said, what the college sponsors are the LORA Scholars. LORA stands for um, uh, Liberal Arts Undergraduate Research Awards. And as it's the norm, when it comes to these opportunities, the students should, you know, you should start thinking about some of the topics that interest you. If you have a good experience in a class, if you have an aha moment in a class with a professor, what you should do is explore uh, some of the research that the professor does, and then you can reach out to them and ask them if they would sponsor you for a Laura Scholars Award. Um, normally, we award about six, uh, 60 awards every year. You can work with your professor during the fall, the spring semester, also during the summer. We have had Laura's in every discipline, uh, from psychology to philosophy, criminal justice, political science, Spanish, French. You think you know? You think it? You can do uh, a Laura's uh, a Laura scholarship. Uh, you can have a Laura scholarship uh, exploring themes in those disciplines. Uh, for those of you who are first year students, uh, obviously you cannot do a LORA uh, uh, during your first semester, but you can, after you graduate, still do research with a faculty member during the semester after graduation. So I am convinced that many of you will be LORA scholars. I actually expect many of you to be LORA scholars. I hope that you reach out to me. Uh, but if you want to talk to your chairs, every chair is familiar with the program, so you can also reach out to them, and of course, directly you can talk to the professor. So I just wanted to say, I pull, we also uh, have a website with the uh, awardees, and I just want to tell you some of the uh, titles of some of the projects that were awarded, awarded for summer, for this summer 2020. We have a professor in geography and urban studies, working with an undergraduate student on a project entitled Mapping Forest Laws Due to Agricultural Expansion in a Hotspot of Ecosystem Change in Colombia. We have our very own Robin Colony, who's here in the panel. She's working with a student um, on a project titled Campaign Finance Allegations in the 2020 Democratic Presidential Primary Game Changer or Red Herring. We also have the chair of psychology who's working with a student on a project entitled Leveraging the Construct of Embodiment to Advance Developmental Science. And of course, we have history. Uh, their uh, uh, team, uh, faculty and student team are working on a project entitled The Iran Contract Scandal and Its Impact on US Democracy. So that's just basically a snippet of what we're doing here in the college. 
Uh, and again, I hope that you reach out to me or to your chairs to explore the opportunities uh, with the LORA program. And I am going to give it back to Annette. Thanks, Sandra. So I do want to emphasize that we are, um, we're really thinking through a lot of ways to keep you engaged. We know that this is an unusual set of circumstances that we all find ourselves in. Um, Gabe, I was thinking about the um, workshop that you usually do in the fall that helps students kind of, you know, plan for careers and things like that. And I, I just wondered, how are you translating that from the, exper the in-person experience they had last fall to the online experience you're planning for this year? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, so, for, so for people who don't know, I run a um, one credit professional development course for English majors. I actually work really closely with Liz. Liz, when you were talking, I can't believe five, five over five years. And I say that because it's been uh, such a treat to uh, work with her, but I run a, so it's a professional development course for English majors. Um, in a typical semester, uh, it focuses on, you know, the, the kind of nitty gritty stuff that you need to know and do resume, cover letters, how to job search. Um, and I like to bring in recent um, English graduates to talk about kind of, you know, what they did, the path they took, how they got their foot in the door. Um, and in terms of changing it over, uh, it's, you know, I'm, I'm, so excited again excited and happy because uh, so many people are more than willing to um, the classes on the classes synchronous online so unfortunately we can't meet in person but so many people are excited to they're like Gabe I can come to the class meeting virtually I can do a presentation for you and post it you can connect me with people whatever you think would be the best way to network um, so in many ways, I mean, in keeping with the theme, it's, 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 it's working uh, in that it's, I want English majors networking and talking to and befriending other English majors. Uh, so it's the same with a kind of an online spin to it. That's how I like to, that's how I like to think about it. That's awesome. You know, I think um, all of us can kind of speak to that need for connection. And, you know, that's part of the reason why we chose to do uh, a webinar instead of another email that you might not pay that much attention to that would come in your inbox. So, um, you know, I think if uh, after this, we're going to send a survey out to our students to see is, is this how you like to get information? And what kinds of topics would you like us to address in future webinars? Because I think, you know, it's um, I think it's definitely a medium that we should definitely uh, you know move forward with. Um, Rachel, I have a question that I think would be great for you to answer. Mm -hmm. um, not every course is labeled specifically synchronous or asynchronous. How do I know if we should be in front of a computer for a particular period of time? Right, that's a great question. Um, so I did see in the chat, I'm, I'm assuming this is the question, or not the chat, the question and answer section that, um, yeah, if somebody has a, if your class says it's online and has specific times, then yes, technically a student is expected to be in front of a computer during those times, but I will add something about that. Um, especially in first year writing, you'll notice that our classes are long, they're, they're 100 minutes long. Nobody's going to want to sit in front of a computer for 100 minutes, even doing really exciting, engaging things. So our goal is to have that, that meeting time exist for some big meetings of the entire class, but sometimes it'll be a small group meeting. Sometimes it will be um, a 45 minute meeting and then the professor will send you off to go do something else and come back at the end or maybe not even come back. So there are gonna be a, a variety of ways that that online synchronous time is gonna be used. It's not always gonna be used where you're just stuck in front of this computer for that whole period of time. I would say that every class is slightly different. So if you have a class that is online and has a synchronous time, you'll wanna, you can certainly email the professor now and ask some questions about it. That's one way. But the other way is to wait until the syllabus is out and you can take a look at the syllabus. It should spell out exactly what's expected. Um, if you find that a syllabus does not spell out what's expected, ask. It should. I, we've, all been, we've all been talking about that all the time, that we need to make very clear when a student is expected to be in front of their computer when they're not. Um, so hopefully there will be some flexibility. I, I imagine in most classes there will be some flexibility um, if they're synchronous online. If they're asynchronous, you won't see any meeting times at all, and they'll just be labeled as online. Um, and those are less common, I think, but they're, they certainly exist. Uh, my class is currently one of those. Uh, I'm fully asynchronous. 
uh, for the fall. So you'll see a variety of ways. And, and if you have questions, email the professor, or if there's not a name listed, so some instructors are not listed yet, you can contact the director of the program or the chair of the department. Um, they could certainly give you advice about that. It's important that you know what you're getting into. I get that. I would want to know the same thing. What, what is it I'm going to be expected to do? When will I need to be there? Um, how is this going to look? You're welcome to ask. No, none of us would be afraid to answer that question on an individual basis. Feel free to, to email. Yeah, I think that's really good advice that, you know, the department chairs generally know what's happening with individual courses. If you aren't sure how to find out who the department chair is for the class that you're taking, um, the bulletin, bulletin.temple.edu lists the uh, department chair and the undergraduate director and the faculty advisors for all the different uh, programs in the College of Liberal Arts. So that's one just easy place to do. It's my own personal plug because it is my job to edit the bulletin and I know none of you read it. So um, they're all laughing because every year I, I press people to write really exciting things for the bulletin and here we are. Um, we have several people have asked questions about the technologies that are uh, gonna be required for our classes. And I think, um, First, I want to tell you about a temple resource that is very, uh, very useful. Um, it's the website itsits.temple.edu. And there you can click a link for uh, kind of student resources. You can download copies of Microsoft Office and other uh, really important uh, software packages for you to use. There's also descriptions of Canvas and other platforms that you may interact with. But if you're talking about just straight up technology, honestly, your average laptop or desktop computer is going to be perfectly fine for you. Um, you don't need all the bells and whistles that an engineering major needs or something like that. Really, if you can access the Internet and if you can write papers and not copy the Internet into your paper, that's better, um, then you'll you'll find yourself in good shape. But we'll also send out <clears throat> a follow up to this with. Um, some other recommendations. If you haven't purchased a computer yet, we can make some general recommendations for you. So we will, um, that'll be a follow-up thing for us. Uh, looking for the other questions we have and had. And if I can just jump in there. Just oh to yeah, say, yeah, great. I Thanks. think it's, uh, I think any computer really from the last three or four years is going to meet your needs. But in addition to the things that Annette mentioned, I think it is important that you have a camera uh, obviously, so that uh, you can join into virtual sessions. And, you know, most computers and laptops these days will have a built-in camera, they'll have a built-in microphone, and they'll have built-in speakers. Everything in Canvas is basically, it's web-based. So if you can connect to the internet and you can get onto the web, you can get onto Canvas and you can have the resources through Canvas. So everything is going to be web-based. There are some courses, for example, in geography and urban studies, perhaps, that need a specialized um, access to some specialized software. But the college is well aware of that and is working on making those things available for the courses that would need them. Sorry, Annette, I just wanted to just add that. No, that's really helpful, I think, especially since that's your that's your area. Um, and really, these questions, they we can open them up to anybody. Um, we have a question about which courses are more likely to be in person. So I think this really is variable throughout the college. And I think um, I think I want to say that there are some courses that are better taught online than in person. For example, some of our um, world language departments really feel like the conversation between two or three students is an invaluable uh, skill that they're going to practice in those classes. But with social distancing, that's almost impossible. And, you know, um, using facial expression as a form of communication, it's almost impossible to do that behind a mask. So several of our uh, language departments decide to go almost completely online. So I just want to, you know, if you're taking a French class, it's completely online. There's no question, it's completely online. So, um, but other courses, you know, they're not, they're either going to handle the discussion parts of their class on Zoom or some other technology, and they're going to deliver their courses in person or online, depending. So, you know, the thing I would say is when you're looking at the schedule of classes, you can really tell um, if a class is online, it is either, it either has no time at all, right? So that's an asynchronous course, a class that just kind of exists out there in time and space, and you don't ever get together in a single class meeting. 
Then there are some classes that have a meeting time that says online classroom, and it has a specific meeting time, just like it would have on your roster before, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 10 to 10.50 online classroom. Those are synchronous classes. And as Rachel described, some of those, you know, you'll be in the Zoom for those three hours. In others, you'll be in just for part of the time. Every professor has a lot of latitude about how they're going to do that. But there is an expectation that for those classes, there are definitely going to be some uh, common meeting times that the class will be together because we know that that's an important part of the experience of being a college student. And then there are some courses um, that have a very specific space uh, allocated, right? So those are the classes that are going to be in person. And, um, you know, there will be rooms unlike things that you have done in the past. So, for example, Paley Library, just a couple of semesters ago, you could have gotten a book there. Now um, there will be very large lecture classes. Uh, I should say very large spaces where discussion classes can meet. So, um you know, they're able to spread out with the social distancing requirements and have, you know, 30 or 40 people in a room. Um, you know, those are uh, happening. Part of the reason why some classes are in person for part of the time and online for part of the time is we wanted to kind of spread out the number of sections that have at least partly an online, uh, an in-person component. So I just want to kind of under, uh, underscore that. Does anybody have anything else to say about that in their particular departments where there are specific courses you were gearing towards having in person or online? It was just sort of what made sense for first year students and seniors or anything? No? Okay. So I just wanted to make sure. Um, and I just want to apologize. I am from Philadelphia. I do tend to talk fast when I'm just talking off the top of my head. And people are emailing me on the side saying, slow down. So I apologize in advance. I will say my email address very slowly so that you can write it down and contact me if you have questions about something I discussed. Um, I'm Annette Bakley, I'm AMB at temple.edu. You can feel free to email me really anytime. We wanna make sure we're in contact with you. I just wanna check with our um, administrative folks on the side because we just have a couple minutes left. Does any of the panelists, do you have anything, um, kind of last thoughts you wanted to add to our thing? Sandra, go ahead. I don't know if you want, did you talk about these uh, Zoom zones or did I zone out when you were talking about that? You zoned during the Zoom zones, but we can just reiterate that those are spaces that'll be um, spread around campus where, um, you know, students can work as long as you're wearing uh, earbuds or headphones. Uh, you can listen to your Zoom class. You can participate via chat. We just ask that they're, they remain quiet zones for people to do their work. And they're going to be spread around all over the campus. Um, we are going to have classes in weird spaces that you've never thought of as classrooms, right? So Mitten Hall, the great court, the beautiful, I don't, many of you may have been there for a new student orientation or uh, convocation or some big events. Um, that's going to be a lecture hall that science classes are going to meet in. Um, we really are going to be spread all over. I'm, I really am thinking more about the tents. I'm, I'm loving that, except that it's not always sunny in Philadelphia, so that could be an issue for us. Um, I'm a little concerned there, but we'll see. Yeah, I know, but I'm fucked, right? Yes. So we'll see how that goes. I try to throw in a little Philly jokes here and there when I'm talking in public. It's very weird in the void to try and, like, you just don't get the same feel of uh, the energy. So it is a challenge, but I think, um, you know, learning and participating in uh, events like this, you know, I think about some of the events we were able to hold this summer, right after the Black Lives Matter issues in that uh, came up in June, we held a webinar similar to this that was sent out to faculty, staff, students, the public, and we had over 800 participants in that event. So you know, just thinking about the number of people who are able to connect and participate that wouldn't have been able to do that, you know, six months or a year ago. So, it, you know, there are real opportunities here. We're very excited about the fall semester, kind of to see what happens. And, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to it. Again, feel free to email me, amb at temple.edu. I really will either directly answer your question or push you into, um, 
a friend of mine who will answer the question across campus. This is kind of how we do things around Temple, right? We we use a network of colleagues and friends, and these are the people I could call last week and say, hey, we want to do a webinar. So here we are. Thank you very much to our panelists and to you folks who participated with us this evening. Um, we are recording this. So um, again, we'll send some information out to you. There will be a slide coming up now with um, some additional resources, and we look forward to seeing you in the fall. Go Owls. Bye. Bye, everyone.